Well, hello everybody. My name is Jesse and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. I know we've got a bunch of new faces today, both as our speaker and with our classrooms. And so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through like a gazillion live free interactive broadcast. We've had over 500 since September alone. They're all on our YouTube channel. You can check out absolutely every single one at your convenience whenever you want. It's kind of a fun deal. Now, today isn't just a normal day. Today Today is World Oceans Day, June 8th. Every single year we commemorate and showcase ocean researchers, explorers from all around the globe. And what started as a one-day event has sort of expanded into this crazy series of programs. We've got 25 programs this week. Everything from penguins to sea turtles, live shark feeding, to so much more. But today, this specific program is uh, our, our sort of centerpiece of our Ocean Week Canada series. Now, across Canada, there's a major Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition that works with all sorts of organizations coast to coast to coast to bring together hundreds of live programs, virtual programs, learning resources, and so much more. And so I really encourage all of you to check out oceanweekcan.ca to learn more, keep the excitement going, and feel connected to the sea no matter where you're joining from in Canada or around the world. Now, Today, I have a very exciting topic with our, our speaker. We are joined live by Neha Acharya Patel, and she is gonna to talk to us today about eDNA. Now, I am a tremendous science nerd. I love everything science. I love everything space and nature and so, so much more. And I must say, one of my very favorite things I've ever learned about, especially in the last 10 years, is this concept of eDNA. What on earth is eDNA? We're gonna find out together and how Neha uses it to understand more about the health of our oceans. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring you into the broadcast, turn it over to you, and you can explain to us a little bit about this really cool science you're up to. So welcome in for Ocean uh, Day. So nice to have you here. Hi, thank you so much, Jesse. I'm really excited to be here today. Awesome, well, feel free to dive in with the presentation. We've got groups joining us on YouTube and Salmonar. We've got our Truro Middle School crew live with us in StreamYard, uh, and we'll get underway for our, our Q&A later. Okay, great, so I'll just uh, start sharing then. Beautiful, all right. Great, Fantastic. so I'm just assuming you guys are seeing. Yep, you're good to go, you're perfect. <laughs> okay, great, well, um, I just want to say hi. So everybody, I'm Neha Acharya Patel, as Jesse nicely introduced me. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about a little bit about myself, um, my career as a little explorer, and then I'm going to be talking about my research. So where we can use some really cool molecular tools to uh, see the invisible, essentially, to see things that we can't see with our own eyes um, in the oceans. I just want to start with my territorial acknowledgement. So I'm speaking to you today from Victoria, British Columbia, which is the traditional territory of the Lekwungen, Wasainich, Esquimalt, um, and Songhees peoples, whose traditional relationship to this land and to the oceans, of course, continue to this day. So as Jesse said, it's World Oceans Day. So happy World Oceans Day uh, to to wherever you're joining from. Um, and I'm so honored uh, that I get to talk to you today on this very special day. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit first about who I am. So I'm sure as you guys grow older, you'll realize there's a lot of different descriptors that you have to describe yourselves. But for me, the most important one is I'm a really passionate ocean advocate. So I've dedicated my life sort of to the protection and the understanding of our oceans. And one of the most important ways I do that is through science. So I'm a marine scientist. I've worked in a lot of different fields. My background is in marine ecology. And now I'm working in molecular ecology. So using molecular or genetic tools to ask questions about marine ecosystem health. But I also like to spend a lot of time in the water. So I'm a free diver, um, which for me is a really fun way to explore our oceans because we get to use our mind and our bodies to hold our breaths uh, and go down and see the cool creatures that live under the surface. Oh, that was one. I am also a commercial and research diver. So whenever I have to go underwater for longer than that one or two minutes that I'm able to with free diving, or if I actually have to do work down there, I use scuba. So scuba diving is one of the really important tools that I've used throughout my career to explore our oceans. Um, and so what you can see this photo here is actually in the kelp forests of British Columbia. And on this trip, we were doing herring surveys. 
surveys. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of surveying um, as this talk continues. But the herring surveys are really important. The herring is a really important uh, fish here in British Columbia. And every year we count all of the eggs that all the herring lay. Uh, and this is really important because I'm sure many of you guys eat seafood. But if we want to make sure that that we're, we're still able to access um, wild caught fish as food sources, we need to be able to assess their populations. And so in this photo, and a lot of what I do is, is assessing fish populations using different methods. And finally, I like to say that I'm an explorer. So I love to ask questions about the world around me and I love to explore. So I love to go to different places around the world, meet different people who have different perspectives on some of the same issues that affect all of us. Throughout my career, I have been really lucky. I've been able to travel to some really crazy places. So here I am diving, I'm doing some, um, some work in the coral reefs in the coral triangle. So this is in the Philippines. And I'm sure many of you guys have heard about coral bleaching, which is an issue that's affecting a lot of the corals around the world. Um, and I honestly didn't know if I was ever going to be able to see such healthy coral reefs in my lifetime. Luckily, there's a lot of people who are working on figuring out ways to make corals more resilient or to make sure that we can preserve these ecosystems because they are really important for ocean biodiversity. As you can see, though, I'm in a very nice little thin, cute wetsuit there, um, but the oceans aren't always this nice and comfortable. So here I am diving in Antarctica. And in Antarctica, it was really cool diving there because when we surfaced, we had to make sure that, oops, we, we don't hit any of the ice at the surface. Um, and what I was doing in Antarctica is we were studying some Antarctic sponges. And you might think sponges, like who cares about sponges? But sponges are really important animals. They actually, they actually do something called filter feeding. So they suck water in and they eat all of the little animals and plants that get sucked in. And what this does is it sucks a lot of water and basically gets nutrient cycling going in the ocean. And sponges, just the vast number of them and how much water they cycle, actually can impact how global ocean uh, nutrients move. So sponges on the bottom of the seafloor in Antarctica can actually impact what's going on in different places in the ocean. I also was really lucky to be able to dive in the Arctic. So that's at the opposite pole of Antarctica. So this here is me doing some dive surveys um, in the Canadian Arctic. And the, the Arctic is unfortunately warming at twice the rate of the global average. So it's all the more important to understand what's going on there now so we can help to mitigate those changes or help to understand, hmm, like what should we do to make sure that the ocean can continue to provide the life-sustaining ecosystem services that, has, that it has been providing for millennia. I've also included this cool photo of this uh, jellyfish here because it... Uh, it only lives in the Arctic and it swims upside down. So I thought it was cool and I just wanted to pop it in there. But so why should we care about all of these things? The Arctic Ocean, the Antarctic Ocean, the, the warm water in the Philippines, they may not all seem so connected, but we truly live in a one ocean world. What's going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic can totally impact uh, what's going on in the coral reefs or the kelp forests here in British Columbia. And overall, all of our oceans or our one ocean is really, really stressed. There's a lot of things that are happening that are adversely impacting the ocean. So these are things like ocean warming, ocean acidification, overfishing, uh, pollution, biodiversity loss. I could keep going. And it's not really easy to think how, hey, like us sitting in our classrooms or sitting at home, how are we closely connected to a sponge at the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean? But human health is intimately connected to ocean health. So for example, about 40% of the global population relies on the sea as their primary source of protein. Or half of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from the ocean. So literally every one breath out of two breaths that you take, that oxygen came from the ocean. 
and changing conditions globally. So as the oceans continue to change, this can really influence the resilience of marine ecosystems. So that's why it's really important for us to figure out ways where we can understand the health of marine ecosystems um, so we can help to mitigate uh, changes or help to make sure that the ecosystem can continue to survive in a way that is sustainable and healthy. One of the ways that we can measure ecosystem health is through measuring biodiversity. So biodiversity is essentially the number of species, a uh, number of different species within an ecosystem. So for example, in this picture alone, you can see there's a big sea star in the middle. There's a lot of fish swimming around. You can see these uh, animals are called tunicates. Um, we also have all these little white things on the rock or tube worms. We've got hydroids in the background, but all of these animals together make up a functional ecosystem. And the more biodiverse an ecosystem, generally we can say that those ecosystems are more healthy. And over the last many years, we have a lot of different ways where we can study biodiversity. So one of the ways that uh, is more traditional that's been happening for a long time, which is one of my favorites, is through dive surveys. So when we do dive surveys, we go out, we lay out a long line and we'll swim along the line. And once we're swimming along the line, we'll, we'll count all the fish that are there, we'll identify them. Sometimes we'll even measure their size. Um, and we'll also um, do the same with the animals and the plants on the sea floor. And though traditional methods like scuba surveys are really useful and they've been really useful for a long time, they do have some limitations. So for example, you have to be a scuba diver, right? To do a scuba survey, you need to have all of that training, have all of the equipment. You need to have boats to go out uh, to really far places. You need to know how to identify all of those species and everything that's going on around you. So there's, it makes it difficult and not so accessible to get a lot of data. And right now, as things are changing so rapidly, it's really important that we can increase all the distance that we're able to monitor as well as how often we can monitor. So that brings me to the tools that I'm using now to study biodiversity. So this is environmental DNA. And as Jesse said, environmental DNA is genetic material that is found in the environment. So you know how you and I, we're always shedding skin. And actually, since the beginning of this talk, about 10 minutes ago, we've all shed more than a billion skin cells. <laughs> just think about that. And so everything in the ocean is also shedding skin, just like these California sea lions, or sorry, these Australian sea lions, the seagrass, all of the living organisms are constantly shedding little bits and pieces of DNA into the ocean. And just a little reminder, DNA is the genetic code for life. So all living organisms have a specific genetic code, and we can use that code to identify what animal, uh, what animal that those little bits and pieces of DNA comes from. I just liked this comic, so I had to throw it in there. <clears throat> so my research is focused on using environmental DNA to assess ecosystem health. So what we do is we go out into the ocean, we either collect water using uh, boats, or we go out and we go diving and collect water, and we take the, that water and we filter it. So we filter all of that water onto a tiny little paper filter. We can then extract the DNA from that filter and then use the DNA to ask important questions about the ecosystem. So we can ask questions like, hey, what species are here? We could ask how many fish or how many of this certain animal that we care about is here. We can also ask questions like, are there rare, important, or even invasive species here? So it's a really cool tool and its power and how many, the different ways we can apply it are growing because the whole field is growing. So molecular techniques like DNA um, amplification, sequencing, all of these different techniques uh, are becoming a lot more accessible. So my research here, I am out in the field, I'm collecting some eDNA samples um, underwater, are to first to see if we can develop eDNA tests to detect our species of interest. We want these tests to be really powerful and sensitive, so a lot of different people can use them. 
We also want to compare eDNA methods to more traditional methods like diving. So here, this is what it looks like when we're out on the reef and we're doing dive surveys. So we're counting and identifying all the animals. Um, you can see I have this big fancy camera that we can use to measure uh, fish size. But imagine you're a fish and you see this big person coming towards you. Sometimes you can hide. So I might miss a fish that's hiding or maybe you're a fish that lives a lot deeper. So sometimes um, with dive surveys, we miss important animals. So that's where comparing dive surveys to eDNA surveys, we can get some really cool complementary data that's really useful to managers or to decision makers that decide, um, decide on conservation areas or how many fish we can take the next year. Oops. Okay, we then want to be able to use these tests to estimate animal abundance. And abundance is a fundamental population parameter in ecology. So like I said before, if we want to be able to manage a population, we need to know how many there are. And if we can use just a scoop of water to estimate an entire population, that is really, really exciting. And finally, we want to make these techniques useful for community-based monitoring. So we want it to be that you don't have to be a scientist or a diver to go out and collect seawater. We want it so that maybe even one day you guys can go out with your teachers out into the field and collect seawater and then send us the water. This is really important because, like I said, then it can increase the, the area and the frequency with which we can monitor. So I'm just going to finish my talk with a couple of the animals that we are actually working with and a little bit of some cool data. So one of the animals that I'm focused on is called the yellow eye rockfish. And this fish is really cool for a lot of reasons. First of all, it can live to up to 200 years. So I don't even know if you guys knew that fish can live that, that long, but these fish uh, can live <laughs> over 200 years, which is way longer than, how, than, than humans, obviously. It is also a really culturally important fish to the First Nations on the central coast of British Columbia. So this has been a really important food source for First Nations for uh, over a thousand years. And unfortunately, it has been overfished over the last decade or so. So now it is listed um, under the Species at Risk Act. And it is also an indicator species. And indicator species are really cool because they give us broader information about the ecosystem. So if we know that the yellow eye rockfish is somewhere, we can kind of extrapolate and say that, okay, this ecosystem is probably doing well because this it's, it's, it's supporting the yellow eye rockfish. And also the yellow eye rockfish lives deeper than most divers can reach. And so this makes it a really good candidate for eDNA monitoring. Another animal that we're looking at is the Olympia oyster. I don't know if you guys like oysters, some people really hate them, but the Olympia oyster was actually overfished in the 1950s. So we almost fished it into extinction. And so in the 1950s, it was listed under the Species at Risk Act as a species of special concern. And um, what we want to do is we want to see if we can detect where it is and if we can estimate abundance, so how many uh, how many oysters there are. And so last year we went and we did a really cool experiment and we went out to places where we know that there's a lot of Olympia oysters, so high density sites. We went to some sites where there, we knew there were some oysters, but not that many. And then we went to a site where we knew there was no Olympia oysters. And then we took three uh, water samples and we tested it with our eDNA test. And luckily we uh, were able to do what we wanted to do. We could see we could detect our, our target species, and we could also look at how many of our target species there are. So this is really cool. This is super exciting, and it can be used to manage uh, the harvesting and how we, uh, we maintain protected areas for this important species. So I think I've talked about why this is important a lot, but I'm going to talk about it one more time. So we do need easier, cheaper, and more accessible ways to monitor ocean biodiversity. And as these molecular tools become more powerful, this is a really cool way with a lot of potential. And as the oceans continue to change, we do need more people 
like you guys hopefully, involved in sustainable ocean careers. So right now it's the start of the UN Ocean Decade. And so for the next 10 years, there's going to be lots and lots of cool stuff happening in the oceans that hopefully I have maybe inspired some of you guys to, to maybe get interested in. And finally, I want to end by saying we're all connected to the ocean. It is sometimes easy to forget that us on land, maybe inland if you're from Ontario or, or the prairies, that we're all really, really closely connected to the ocean. So I challenge you this week to maybe think of a way where you can help the ocean. So maybe you can look up a cool animal or look up something cool about the oceans that you didn't know before or pick up some trash or something like that. But I just really want us all to remember that we are all really, really connected to the ocean and we all need it for our lives. So with that, I want to say thank you so much to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants um, for inviting me today to talk. And also to all the organizers for Ocean Weeks Canada, uh, like the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. I'm super, super excited that I was able to talk to you about my research today. So um, I'd like to end just uh, with my, uh, with if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Fantastic. What a great picture to end on, too, with you and the penguins. I just love it. Um, but yeah, let's dive in with Q&A. Folks on YouTube, if you guys want to share in the chat, please do. Truro Middle School will come to you guys in a second. I'll give you a minute to put the thinking caps on. But I'm really curious, a question that we inevitably get with divers that have been all over the world. And it's a really hard one. Is there a favorite place you have to dive or are there like too many to possibly count? I'm really curious. Um, there are so many amazing places. Um, and I think my answers changed over time, but I find that I, there's a very, once you become a cold water diver, yeah. you find a really unique and amazing beauty in the cold water. And I am very biased towards the kelp forest of British Columbia here in Canada. So that's probably been my answer. On this note, so we have um, regularly on the program, Jill Heinrich. She's like the world's leading cave diver. She's gone all over the world. She's done some amazing things. And when we ask her this question, BC's coast, like British Columbia's coast is one of the most universally picked places as the best place to dive on the planet, which is wild to me and very, very cool. So I'm so glad that's your pick. Um, I want to know too, actually, I'm curious, um, at what age did you start scuba diving? I keep asking this of all of our Ocean Week speakers. I'm curious. <laughs> So I actually started scuba diving when I, I got my license when I was 15 with my dad and I'm from Ontario. And so we went out in the lake yeah. in Ontario and it wasn't that exciting to be honest. Um, and then I didn't really dive again until I came out to university in Vancouver. And then as soon as I went in the ocean, I was like, ah, this is so cool. And then I never stopped. I was even worse than you. I was in a quarry with like literally nothing in it, like an empty quarry that had just been like filled with water. Uh, but I do want to note our entire audience today, I know we've got a lot of grade sevens and eights. You guys are already well past the age that you can start scuba diving. And for really young kids, I know we have some throughout Ocean's Week, a Paddy Bubble Maker. At eight years old, you can start in the path to becoming a scuba diver. And it's like black magic. You can breathe underwater. It's amazing. It opens up 70% of the world to you. Uh, and you can whether you end up quite as adventurous as they are or not, uh, it's just a really magical way of exploring the natural world. So I'm so glad we mentioned that. Let's head to our Truro Middle School friends about as far across the country as we can be from you there in Victoria. Do you guys have a question for us uh, in Nova Scotia? Oh, <laughs> ah, yes, you are on camera, I know. It's very exciting. Do, do we have any questions? Because we both, myself and Jesse both know that I always have questions. Always. Oh, and Virgil, uh, we have one question. Virgil, what's your question? Um, how, how far can you tell, like, like the deviant item, how far can you tell where people have? Yeah. So, like, how far can you tell where, like, the, the animal's been there, or is that the idea? Like, how, like, for example, how, like, like far like, an animal is away? One, like, sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, how sensitive is the test? And I, I love this. There's many versions of this question. But like, what can you detect? How much of something has there to be for you to know that it's there? That's a really, really good question. And it's actually a really hard question. And a lot of scientists are working on that. And so something that's really cool. So eDNA first started being used mostly in fresh water. So in lakes where there's not a lot of movement or a lot of times in rivers. And so with rivers, it's kind of nice because we know, okay, water is only really flowing in one way. And so a lot of, of, of scientists will take an eDNA sample from one place and they'll take into account, okay, the water is flowing this fast. And so you can take water speed into account. 
But in the ocean, of course, we're in a much more complex system where we have currents, we've got tides, we've got swell, and we've got all of this wa water movement happening. And so actually, that's a really, really important question. Um, there's been a lot of different studies, and they have found that even though there's a lot of water movement, eDNA signals tend to be pretty localized. So you can actually take a water sample from one place and then a water sample 50 meters away about will have a totally different biodiversity. So it totally depends, but it is pretty localized. So you can usually tell within about 50 meters, um, but that's uh, that also brings up the question of time. So sometimes if a fish has been there, um, you won't be able to tell it has been there, like if it was like three day, three or three days ago to around a week. Um, but again, that also can depend on what animal it is. There's a lot of different factors, yeah. but that's a really good question that that scientists are thinking about. It is, but I love the idea that it's fairly local because I'd always wonder this about eDNA. If there's a shark that's like 20 kilometers down the bay and uh, you know the water flows, you're not gonna get a big enough sample to know, oh, okay, that shark was here. You're not gonna get something that's glaringly wrong because of how ocean currents operate, which is very, very neat. Okay, um, Turo, I'll give you guys a little more time if you have any other questions. Oh, you do have another question. We'll come right back then. I love it. You're live with us. Go for it. All right, hey. go ahead, Lily. Um, I was wondering how accurately you can detect how many of a certain species there are. Yeah, how do you accurately tell how many of a certain species there are? So, like, how do you know there's a hundred or something versus two of something? What's the signal? You guys are asking really good questions. I was like trying to see how how complex should I go? And I, I obviously should have gone a little more complex. So um, what, what we do is we use a tool called qPCR, which is the same tool actually that I'm sure you guys have all heard we, we, to, to, to do COVID tests. And what it essentially does is say that we have, say that there was two copies of DNA in our starting sample, um, that that DNA gets amplified a bunch. And so essentially what we can do is we can correlate the strength of the amplification signal to the starting copy number. And so then what we do is we can uh, use different models, essentially. So we can go out and we, we have to collect baseline data. And so then we can fi finally establish a relationship between our qPCR result and the starting number of animals. And so there's a lot of like modeling in between, but it's essentially linking copy number of DNA fragment to animal number in the environment. There you go. I, I see, I, you never know when where DNA conversations are gonna go, but you guys do have really detailed questions and I love it. Yeah. I'm really curious if in this approach, we've ever discovered any novel species. Now we're still in the early days of getting DNA sort of knowledge of every creature on the planet we're nowhere near that yet but have we ever picked up a signal we're like we have no idea what that is that like seems like something we know but not quite or not yet so that's a really good question but um so one of the cool things you can do if you're trying to characterize whole community biodiversity is this thing called barcoding right so you know if you go to the grocery store and you uh scan the barcode of a chocolate chip cookie it's going to come up like that and so there are some regions of the genome or the mitochondrial genome that are kind of like a barcode. And so you can scan that region and you're like, okay, that's this species. But to do that, you have to have a reference, right? So you have to have somebody had to go and take that animal, get that genetic information. And so you know that that is your barcode. And so right now what we're doing is because we don't have, there's so many animals in the ocean, we do not have a lot of genetic sequence information that we can use as a barcode. So right now there's a lot of different organizations around the world. Actually, one of them is called Bold and it's in Guelph, Ontario. And yes. they are trying to build up a repository or a library of all of these barcodes. And so then one day you, we will hopefully be able to have so many that maybe Jesse one day that'll happen where we'll discover something that's that's unknown um very very cool uh, Guelph gets mentioned a lot when it comes to cool DNA stuff I'm bringing up the site for the whole project right now so that everyone can have that uh, but it's really amazing science they're doing there and it's so exciting to do 
deep sea and, and ocean in general uh, sort of biodiversity sampling because it's one of those places like rainforest that every time we go with a scrutinizing eye, we find new species. Like literally every time you send a submersible down, you send a research team down and you start looking for new things, you find them because there's so much left to be discovered. We have barely scratched the surface of the oceans and it's such an exciting time to be in science. Um, you talk at the end of your talk about this idea of a future where hypothetically, you know, maybe people, citizen scientists could get involved in this and help out. Is there a way right now that anything like this exists, whether it's charting biodiversity, uh, whether it's sending in potential DNA samples, or are we not quite there yet in any fashion? Well, so there's lots of citizen science initiatives. Um, eDNA specifically, there have been a couple of programs. So uh, there's a group here um, with, uh, it, with DFO that's already started doing some citizen science stuff. Um, we are hopefully going to get to the point. One of the things is we just need to make sure that it's a standardizable way that people are aren't contaminating the samples. But there are a lot of organizations who are doing it uh, right now. There aren't any well-established programs in Canada, so you, we're not at the point where you can get involved now. But hopefully, we will be the, will we will be there in the next couple of years for sure. Very soon, fingers crossed. In the meantime, one thing that we used for our Backyard Bio campaign in May, just as an encouragement for all our classes, the Seek and the iNaturalist apps are amazing. Like the coolest tools ever to come in citizen science if you wanna learn more about local biodiversity and find what other people like you have discovered around the world. So very, very cool stuff. Um, yeah, we got some great questions coming from our Division 24 classroom in Salmon Arm, BC, right near you. Uh, so Ari asked, how do you stay warm enough when diving in cold water? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, what we do, well, we use a dry suit, first of all. So we're not using a wetsuit. So a dry suit basically has seals around your wrists and your neck. So the only part of you that's actually wet is your head and your face. Um, and then what you do is underneath your dry suit, you wear a lot of sweaters. And that's basically it. There are some really fancy divers who have these vests that are actually heated with the battery pack. But those are really expensive, and I'm not that fancy, so I yeah. just wear a lot of sweaters. Yeah, uh, I like that between dry suit and wetsuit. Very few people take the time to delineate between those two, so I appreciate that. Um, okay, a couple more from Division Twenty Four, and then Truro. If you guys have more, we'll come back to you as well. Uh, Melissa asked, "How does the DNA eDNA stay intact in the water? Why does it not just break apart?" You guys are asking such great questions. So, actually, you're right my DNA does break apart in the water. So in our cells, we have our nucleus and within our nucleus, we have our nuclear DNA and that in, in one cell, there's one set of nuclear DNA, but also within one cell, we have the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA. There's sometimes thousands of copies of mitochondrial DNA in one cell. And so what we do as scientists, we're like, okay, like nuclear DNA, there's not that much. It's probably breaking up quite a bit. Um, so what we do is we target mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA exists in a circle. So it's a little less likely to break down and because there's a lot of it, but it still might break down. So what we do as well is we target regions that are only maybe 100 to 200 letters or base pairs long. Um, and the mitochondrial genome itself is like 16,000. So basically, we're hedging our bets and saying that, okay, like, there's so many mitochondria, they're mm -hmm. probably breaking apart. But if we just target this 200 base pair region, it'll probably still be intact. I love this. And and I mean, you have quashed all our dreams of Jurassic World, the Dominion coming out tomorrow, uh, the idea of having DNA last for millions and millions of years, not happening, unfortunately. It's kind of sad. I wish we could get T-Rex back, but alas, not from the kick cards. Uh, but again, I, I appreciate the, the diving in with some of the science. And again, students, you guys are probably a few years away from this in, in actual school, but there's some really neat stuff and tons of popular science books on this, uh, resources online, so, much, uh, so many ways to learn more about this. So I, I love the, that question. Truro, unmute your mic, come on back, and we'll take another uh, four from our, our YouTube groups. We're whipping through these guys. Come on back in, unmute your mic. There you go. Do we have any more questions? Oh, Ellie has a question. Just a second. No, you don't have a question? Oh, nope. I have a question. Um, what inspired you to go towards sciences? Yes. Uh, thanks for asking that. I, 
I find I've always been a scientist. I think I was mind blown when I was pretty young, when I realized that not everybody was as into the bugs and like didn't spend all their spare time in the swamps. So I've just always been like that. And I think um, if you are, if you're one of those people that's asking questions about the world around you, you're probably a scientist. <laughs> I love that. Honestly, it's so interesting how many people's careers start with insects and just getting out of their back, literal backyard and exploring. Um, but I, I like to note this too, throughout Oceans Week, throughout our, our programs all month long, um, if you're interested in the scientific enterprise, if you want to be on something like a dive research ship, you don't need to be a top scientist. Like You don't need to have the same academic background that they had us. You can be a cook. You can be a pilot. You can be a, a technician. You can be someone who drives the boat. I mean, there's so many ways of getting involved in this, especially when you get to things like space or Antarctica or ocean exploration in general. So I think that that's a important note too. But if you are a super nerd like the two of us and love bugs and taking pictures of them and having them in the, you know, your back drawer, uh, it's a good start on your path to science if you're keen on that. All right, time flies and you're having fun. So I'm going to take two more quick questions before we wrap up together. Uh, first is from Colton. How long does it take to test for eDNA? Like how long can you do this on the boat while you're there? Or do you have to send it back to a lab? What's going on? Yeah, so um, if you have your eDNA test already made, which a lot of times we do, it literally can take like around two hours if you're in the lab. Um, you, so you ex or maybe like three or four hours, you extract your DNA and then you do your qPCR test. Then there's other questions that might take a little longer, but a lot of scientists right now are trying to figure out a way where you can do it in the moment. So they're trying to make some samplers that you can literally set out in the ocean and they'll grab a sample, filter it, extract it, and test it all, all like automatically. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening and hopefully within the next couple of years, this technology will be more, more uh, used. Well, again, like, I, again, our students have grown up in this world where, like, DNA is uh, everywhere, and the idea of sequencing a genome is pretty common. Uh, like, even in the 90s, this was like a many billion dollar enterprise over 10 years, 15 years to set up things like this that can now happen for, like, 500 bucks on a, you know, a ship-based lab tech thing in two seconds flat. I mean, that's amazing how fast that that technology transitioned and evolved. So, very, very cool stuff. Now, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about all some of the places you dove. Uh, McGuire wanted to know, McGuire, first of all, really cool name, never seen the name McGuire ever, so that's my plug of the day. I uh, wanted to know how many places have you actually visited to test for eDNA? Is that fairly limited still or everywhere you go or are you just putting that thing in the water? Okay, so so me personally, most of my eDNA work has happened in British Columbia and I've, I've joined some other scientists in uh, Baja, California in Mexico. Um, yeah, but eDNA science is happening all around the world. It's growing really, really rapidly. Yeah, very, very cool. And lucky you, Baja, Mexico. For anyone who doesn't know, some of the coolest diving in the world is off Baja, Mexico. The entire, the entire west coast of North America is pretty exceptional. So lucky you for picking the coolest career of all time. Um, I wanted to share just a few uh, last things for everyone who might be keen. Again, you've got an amazing website with some of your photography, research, outreach stuff. Uh, people can check that out in the link below. I will, I've already put that in the YouTube chat for everyone. You also shared a fantastic learning module uh, as part of the Oceans Week celebrations. And so what I'm gonna do is from the SOI Foundation, put that in our comments as well. Put it here in the private chat for everyone and bring it up on a banner. Uh, and everyone else can also keep learning going at oceanweekcan.ca. There's so much to discover. Again, hundreds of events happening across the country, live and virtually, uh, and so many opportunities to keep the excitement about the oceans going. There is the SOI Foundation site, a little bit unwieldy URL, but you all have that in the link. And before we wrap up together, we bring in our Truro Middle School friends to say a big thank you and farewell. Is there a final message you want to leave our kids with today about this, this field, your work, anything to send them off with? <laughs> well, I think I probably said it a lot already in my talk, but I, the ocean, we need the oceans. We yeah. really need them. And so um, I really encourage you guys to explore different careers in, 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 in ocean fields. There's a lot. You don't have to be a scientist. Like, actually, I just found out recently that ROVs, so ROVs are like underwater robots. They're looking for people who are really into video games uh, to, to uh, pilot ROVs. So you might not be particularly interested in like a oyster at the bottom of the uh, on the seafloor, but you don't have to be. And there's so many cool ocean careers. Um, and so I really encourage you to look, think outside the box and to look at some cool ways that you can get involved in, 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 in ocean conservation. 
it is good to know that my thousands and thousands of hours of Halo and Call of Duty are going to come in handy. But honestly, we just had, um, we did the Endurance Expedition recently where they sent and they found Shackleton's lost ship 10,000 feet beneath the ice. And I mean, that wasn't a person in a submersible driving it around. That was a person playing with a robot. And you can do that at the bottom of the ocean. You can do that on Mars. And it's so, so cool that they actually are drawing upon these skill sets that people have built up in a really unique way. So... I'm so glad you mentioned that. Uh, and this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for, for capstoning our World Oceans Day. Uh, I hope all our classes take the chance, again, to check out our program series here at Oceans Week Canada, uh, the programs we did to start the week, our final one on Friday, and, of course, oceanweekcan.ca. And since it's your first program with us, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, at Sam and Arm in home, you guys can wave and stream too. Truro Middle School, if you guys want to unmute your mic and join me in saying a big thank you and farewell, you are in. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.